So, so we've been talking about James. It's important for us to understand that James is a half-brother of Jesus. And, uh, and he was also a skeptic for a long time. He, he was trying to figure out who Jesus was. And the resurrection helped James a lot, draw, drew a lot of attention to him, and he connected well with that. And, and that led to him actually being a leader in the uh, Jerusalem church. He really was a leader for Jews who were coming to Christ. And that's the role that James played. Now later, as this book is written, which is quite a bit later, you'll notice there in verse 1 it says, James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. See, James wasn't writing this to his own little congregation that he's got. Instead, this was a letter that would be passed on and carried on all throughout the region because it was to the twelve tribes scattered, scattered among the nations. And we know that there was a great persecution and there was all kinds of things going on in Christians' lives that day. And James is trying to, James is trying to kind of bring this all together a little bit in the name of Christ. And so that's what he does. Now, what we learned in the last two weeks, pretty simple. We learned that we can learn perseverance through trials in our life. And that's an important aspect of our life. Perseverance, it says, will finish its work in us so that you may be complete, not lacking anything. Okay, So if you want to grow and be spiritually mature, you can pretty much assume that God is going to put something in your path that will be a trial of some sort so that you can go deeper and you can cement that faith that you have in your life. And I think that's a pretty great thing that God does. I don't think I like it when I go through trials, but that's growth. Those are growth-producing kinds of things. And then last week, Joel talked about standing up to temptation. And he did a great job unpacking that as well. This is a process. If you look at verse uh, 16, it says, or actually, let's go to verse four, uh, 13. When tempted, no one should say that God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. And then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to to, gives birth to death. And so there's this process that happens. Now, there's a big difference between temptation and trials, okay? There can be things that come in your way in, in your life that are trials, and you're going to do your very best to get through those, and God's going to say, I'm going to help you develop this spiritual gift of, that you have inside of you, the gift of perseverance. Because when you can allow yourself to persevere, and you get in the middle of those trials that you're in, that's when God says, man, you are really coming along and you're going to be more complete and more mature. And so that's really what this book is about. So we get to James 1.19, and I'm picking this up today with James 1.19 through 21, just three verses, and I'll be pretty brief this morning, uh, but I want you to hear the heart of James in this passage. My dear brothers and sisters, now let's just stop there. He's not just writing this letter and hoping it will land someplace. He's writing this letter, and he's writing it to his dear brothers and sisters. These people are close to him. He has a heart for them. He loves them. And I think that that's really a beautiful picture of James among, trying to talk amongst the 12 tribes that have been scattered. And he says, take note of this. In other words, don't miss this. Okay? You may miss other things, but don't miss this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. That's familiar to most of us. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Humbly accept the word planted in you. What he's talking about here is he's talking about the Word of God and how it can change us. And it can change us from the inside out. We're not looking just for information. We say this, I think, every week in this series. We're not looking just for information. We're looking for transformation. God wants to see us change our life and our heart. And he's going to do it with the Word that he's given us. And there are really five things here. We'll kind of fly through these, but I think they'll be meaningful. First of all, we've got to be quick to listen. We have to be quick to listen. That's what he says right there. He says, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. 
I have a friend of mine who, when I go and talk to him, and if I ever say I can sit in a restaurant, I can sit in his office, I can sit somewhere else where there's a lot of busy people coming and going and all that kind of stuff, he has the, the art and the gift of listening to me. I mean, he, sit, he sits there, or he stands, and he looks in my eyes, and he doesn't let go of me. I mean, sometimes I felt like I was in a death stare with him or something, you know, so he's, he's just looking right at me. But what he's doing is, is he's concentrating on what I brought to the table today. It wasn't about him, but it's about me. And that's the way it should be for all of us. We should all be quick to listen. And that doesn't mean just the cursory blow-by kind of thing. That means paying good attention to what somebody's telling you. You think about how much that would help your marriage if you're married, if you were really quick to listen. Or you think about how that would help your uh, relationships at work when people identify you as a person He's listening to me. And I tell you what, when you listen to people, other people will notice it. Because so many of us, hate to say this, but so many of us don't know what listening's all about at all. Reality is, is that most of us have moved on from whatever conversation our friend is talking to us about, and we've gone on to something else. And we do it all up in here. So be quick to listen. You could tell that with my friend, when I get with him, I'm, I'm a priority. I mean, there can be people that walk by his office or there can be people that are in restaurants that want to get to know, they want to say hi to him and stuff. And he's so locked in that they don't do it. And I always leave that conversation thinking, I got to be a better listener. I got to be a better listener. James says here that if you want to be mature as a Christian, you've got to be quick to listen. And that means it's got to be a priority with you. And by the way, one of the, one of the people that you ought to listen to on a regular basis is God. I mean, that ought to be a priority in our life. But a lot of times we don't. He said, "I'm going to read the Bible," and so I read a chapter of the Bible. Okay, I've been there, and the preacher talked about listening to God. I listened because I read a book of the Bible. But how many times have you ever read a chapter in the Bible and put it down and asked yourself the question, "What in the world was he talking about?" You know, now some of it can be because it's maybe complex, but let's be honest, unless you are intentional in your desire to want to listen to what God says through his word, it's going to blow right by you. And so you got to slow down and you got to root out all the, the objects. Okay. I can take my Bible to an Oklahoma state basketball game and think I'm going to read my devotions while the game's going on. I don't do that because that isn't going to work at all. And so you've got to have some intentionality about it, for sure. And I think there's something else kind of playing in here to this idea of quick to listen, and it's this. Every one of us should make the people around us feel like they're valued. And the only way that happens is if you are zeroed in and locked in and not allowing anything else to come by you. It's the same with the Word of God. When you read the Word of God, you are telling God that He is valued in your, your system. It's important. And that's what you can do in order to become more mature and to letting the Word of God change us. The second one is slow to speak. And what I mean by that, I think I put it in your, I guess it's on the screen, keep your mouth closed. I mean, sometimes we do this and sometimes we don't. As a matter of fact, have you ever had a conversation with somebody and you thought the conversation was going this way and so you kind of go along that way and all of a sudden you're on a different freeway headed in a different direction than whatever anybody else wanted you to be because they went this way. And we do that a lot. And I think often because we're not paying attention to the conversations that are being had. And it's the same thing in the Word of God as well. That if we have a heart for who God is, we will pay attention to Him. So we formulate our answers often before the sentence is even empty. I mean, before it's, before it's come and finished. You ever done that? Where you start down a conversation with somebody and you're going, yeah, but. It's all in your head, but you got a case of the yeah, buts, right? We all do, don't we? Because we're all trying to figure out what the answer is to the issue at hand. And it may not even be that we don't even know the answer yet at all. Because we don't know what the question was. Because we're always jumping ahead and getting out in front. So I want to encourage you to be slow, to speak, or quick to listen and be slow to speak. Slow to speak. 
A couple of verses from the book of Proverbs are pretty good. One is Proverbs uh, 17, 28, which says, Every, Even a fool is thought wise if he keeps silent and discerning if he holds his tongue. You ever known somebody who always had to have the big word in the conversation or the last word in the conversation, no matter whether it was good for them or not? You ever known anybody like that? I've known people like that. I've been that kind of person at times in my life because I think I'm smarter than everybody else. And I'm not at all. And what I need to do is be more like a fool and just keep silent because that's what's wise. Proverbs 29, 20 says, Do you see a man who speaks in haste? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Right? It's true, isn't it? If you're always wanting to be the first words out and you always want to have that kind of pressure put on you in your relationships with other people as well as God, you need to be slow to speak, slow to speak. Just listen and be slow to speak. The third one is to be slow to become angry. That means to have a teachable spirit. Teachable spirit. Now he says here, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. You ever known anybody that was always angry at something or someone? Most of us have known people like that. And you just want to go to them and you want to say, Come on, let's drop the, the, the act here, okay? You don't need to be angry at everything in the world. You need to identify what those things are and deal with them. Well, this word anger is, means a slow-burning anger that leads to seething, okay? Now, to utilize my friend Steve, that's every football season in Ohio, okay? <laughs> Steve tries to be slow to become angry, but the Bengals and the Browns don't give you a lot of hope. Not right now, at least. But there are lots of things in all of our lives where we want to flash our anger. And all of a sudden, it's kind of like you see with firemen who go into a house or something like that, open up a door, and they get that fire blowback thing. It comes right out at them like that. That's the way some of us are about how we think about other people. We just get angry and want to blow up everything that we can. And you don't want to do that. And that's what James is saying here is this is in his relationships or their relationships. Be slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that, God's desire, that God desires. Now listen to me. If you're looking for one thing out of this passage, it should be that all of us should have the desire to be what God wants us to be. And our seething, burning anger that blows up on all of everybody else and, and spews just like, you, like it's craziness that's not, going to be the ang- that's not going to be the anger that produces righteousness at all. And I, inevitably, we'll have somebody that will talk about this in the, in the sermon or afterwards about, well, Jesus got angry. Well, yeah, but Jesus' anger was a little different than our anger. It was not a seething, burning, deep blowback all over people. It was that this is wrong and somebody's got to stand up for it. And that's different. So you need to understand, and I need to understand this too, that this kind of anger, if you let it just fester in your heart and life, it will lead to bitterness. And when you have bitterness in your soul, you need to understand that Satan thinks that's the best place for you to be because you will be building bars and cells that you will live in for the rest of your life if you don't get rid of this bitterness. And a lot of times we don't. A lot of times we almost feel righteous by this. You know, it's like, well, I'm being no about this and that. That doesn't work either at all. We should be slow to become angry and have a teachable spirit. This is the most destructive kind of anger there is because you can hide it. You can hide it in your own soul and people don't need to know that you're seething or that you're bitter or anything else. You can cover it up to a point until... There ends up being a moment where it all blows up and then all of a sudden everybody's going, where did that come from? Where did that come from? I never saw that in him before. And uh, somebody might say, well, you don't know him very well or know her very well because that's what she does or he does. So that's wrong. Don't be quick to become angry. Be slow to become angry. And then he says in in, uh, verse 21, he says, therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent. These people had been scattered all over the known world from Jerusalem. 
And in Acts chapter 7 and 8, they left. Some stayed back, mostly leaders of the local church and some of the people that lived in Jerusalem, but the rest were scattered all over the land. And what, what James is saying here is, is that when you, as a Christian, go into this world that you're living in, you need to understand that there's lots of moral filth and there's lots of evil that is so prevalent. And one of the things that every one of us have to do in our lives and the people he was writing to in his day and time is, is that we've got to be on our guard. Be on our guard against moral issues that come along. Be on our guard about sexual immorality. Be on our guard about the moral filth that comes into our homes. Be on our guard about what we watch on TV, what kind of movies we go to. Those kinds of things. What kind of conversations do you have with people at work? Is it God honoring or is it not? And uh, those are the kind of things that you have to do an invitation, an inventory on your own life and ask yourself the question, what is moral filth and what is evil that is so prevalent in my life that it's creating a distance between me and God? That's a big question. If you're transformed by the word of God, then that's going to be a more important question for you. Is what am I allowing to sneak in there? And when you do that, that can be a disaster. Being pure here means being pure on both the outside, which we're pretty good with, but also the inside. And if you remember, Jesus often took the Pharisees to task in his ministry by saying, on the outside you look great, but on the inside it's just terrible. It's just worthless, garbage, and junk. And you need to clean up the inside so that it matches what you think the outside says in your life. Jesus challenged them a lot of times with that. So I know that in the next six weeks or so, some of you are going to do some spring cleaning. And you're going to get in there and clean out all the stuff over winter and fall and all that stuff. Can I just ask you to do one thing? Would you do some spring cleaning on your soul? On your soul. And don't think that your job is to go clean somebody else's soul. Because it's not. And if you came to me and said I was doing this and I was trying to help this person understand everything and she doesn't understand everything and all that, you know what I would tell you? Why did you decide that you were the one appointed to do this? Spring cleaning, you ought to clean up your own soul. Or as Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, you should take the log that is out of your eye and, and, and respect that. So this purity that comes along it's so important, and I think this is a time of year where it's really good. New Year's is over, and you're moving in and out of the Valentine's, and that's over, and Easter's coming up. This would be a great time to make some spiritual cleaning in your own soul, too. Are you doing what God wants you to do? Are you being the person that God wants you to be? And then lastly, it says there, I'll read the whole verse, Therefore get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Now, that's an amazing verse when you think about it because the Word of God actually does get implanted in us. And that is what we can use to, to be more uh, persistent and have more fit, uh, perseverance and so forth. If we are not humble, though, we will not accept the Word in our life. I hope, I really do, I hope that in your life, that you walk out of this place on Sunday thinking about over the next few days, thinking about what is it that God wants me to know about this? How does God want me to react to this? And if that's the kind of reaction that you have to what is preached or in a class or something like that, then you're probably on, on the right track by being humble. But I've, I've talked to lots of people who over the years have kind of walked out of the auditorium and they kind of gripe about one thing, and then they gripe about another thing, and then the music's too loud, and we didn't know a song, and he read, he read through the verses in the wrong version, and you'd just be surprised how nitpicky people could get. And it's really an amazing thing to me, because God is so good, and God is so patient with every one of us, and God is the one that looks down deep in your soul and says, there's some spring cleaning that needs to happen here, now let's do it, and then let's move on from there. So in Luke chapter 8, Jesus tells this parable, this will be pretty familiar too, that a sower goes out to sow some seed. And that's what I do. I sow seed. 
I don't always have all the answers, but I can give the word of God and it can go into your soul and it can penetrate who you are. But for Jesus, he said there was some seed that was sown along the path. Now that path would have been the hard rock side line of a road, okay? And every road's got it. And if you notice, they'll, they bring up the rock and they pack it down and bring more rock and pack it down. And some of that seed, when they scatter it, will get along the path. And you know what? It won't produce anything. Nothing at all. It's gone. And it's a waste. Some, are so, some seeds are sown among the rocks. And so you got path and then you got rocks. And it's pretty much the same with the rocks. There may be a little bit of growth, but it can't be sustained because it's in amongst all the rocks. And then some sow seed amongst the thorns. And that looks good for a while, except then the thorns begin to choke out whatever the plant was that you scattered seed for. And then it says, Jesus says, some of this gets out on the good soil. And what happens? It produces an amazing crop a hundred times over. And that's the, that's the path that God wants us on. Out of all four of those things, you got the paths, you got the rocks, and you got the thorns, and then you've got the seed that's in the, the good ground. All of them are calling, is being able to, it's being able to be put out to people that we should be the one where it lasts, where it lasts. And that means to humbly accept the word in you. You know, if you're going to read the Bible, you pay attention to the Word of God. There are going to be times where God speaks to you and you're going to go, no, I don't want to do that. And I get that. I've been there. I've wrestled with God. I've even been defiant at times. So I don't want to do what you want me to do. But if you have a humble spirit and you have a heart that's humble, when that seed gets passed into the good soil and you're right there, what God is saying is, you're worth it. You're worth my seed to be planted into your life. You're worth being blessed by me. You're worth being the man or the woman that leads a family and you need help. And I'll give you help. I'll sow the seed in your life. So let me ask you today, what kind of soil are you? And if I was to take and start putting out you know, seed probably wouldn't grow very well in here, would it? Or out in our parking lot, or even alongside of the road out there. But if you can find some good ground, it'll grow. Now, I've noticed something over the last three years that's only uh, pertains to you. Every year, at about this time, on our MacArthur Boulevard, these little green things pop up. Every year they do. And they popped up again. And I'm thinking, man, it's a little early for you to be popping up. Because you can get paid off, you get blown away by the winters in March. But every, every year they pop up. And eventually some of them produce flowers too. And that's because the soil right there is pretty good. And year after year after year, it comes back up. I wonder if that's how God feels about us, about you and me. Are we men and women who allow his seed to be penetrating our heart? No matter what we've been through in life, no matter how we're struggling, no matter how bad this winter was, this last winter for you, and for some of you it's been a really tough winter. You've lost somebody you loved or maybe you had difficulty at work or something like that. And so you're wondering, what is God going to do with this? I'm going to tell you, what God will do with it is, is he will do things that will make you persevere. And if you persevere, you will become mature and complete mature and complete. And then who knows? Maybe you're one of those annual buds out there and it pops up every year in the spring and it helps you be sustained to go into the late spring and summer. Who knows? But I want, to know, I want you to know one thing. If I drop seed on this carpet, there ain't nothing that's going to happen to that except it gets sucked up by a vacuum cleaner. Right? So you want to be the right kind of soil. And I think that's really what James is saying here, too. Be what? Slow to, well, what is it? Let me see. Yeah, quick to listen. I get those mixed up. Quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry. That is you protecting the ground in your heart, the soil in your heart, so that God can put 
those, those seeds in your life and you can produce a crop much greater than anything else that anybody would else do. Let's stand if you would, please.